Amazing. So just in case for anyone who doesn't know, I, I was lucky enough to to meet Matthew back at Antigua Forum this year. Matthew was presenting uh, a very important project, which you might be able to tell us about also, also here. If we have some minutes, it would be great to know. And um, well, M Matthew is, is Associate Dean at the uh, Braniff Graduate School of Liberal Arts at uh, University of Dallas. And if you want to, Matthew, maybe before we get started into why reading is important, um, would you like to explain maybe a little bit what you're doing there uh, at the University of Dallas? Yeah, sure. Um, so one of the major things I work on is uh, programs for K through 12 teachers um, who teach in schools specifically dedicated to cultivating character and virtue. Um, and by character, I also mean, you know, moral character. And, you know, this is this is a very tricky thing. Right. Um, you know, something actually that uh, will I was reading something that you had up about how, you know, globally, um, on many, many metrics, people's lives are better, right? Just in terms of their access to medical care, the everyday comforts that they enjoy, their access to technology. Um, and yet we see that, you know, you see greater levels of depression, certainly in the United States and among the young. Um, and there's all sorts of social problems. And you think like, why are things getting worse in certain ways when everything else is so much better. And one of the answers is that we've lost sight of the importance of character and virtue. And, um, but you want to be careful, right? People have taught it before and they've done it badly, right? They've used it as a way to become authoritarian. That's not the right way to do it. So in any event, the programs that I work on at the University of Dallas have to do with supporting teachers, supporting schools, students, communities, so that they can take this up in a way that's really gonna benefit um, the students and the children. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't want to get too philosophical, but I'll want to go back. Um, I'm writing down some, some questions I want to ask you about definitions of, of virtue and character um, but I'm going to wait for that because if we get too philosophic then we might chuck everyone out of the conversation I don't want to do that <laughs> <laughs> uh, so why do you think that reading is is important Matthew oh yeah okay so that's a great question um I mean, there's a lot of different answers you can give to it uh, so I'll walk through a couple of possible ones um one, of course, is that reading is one of the most fundamental ways that we learn about others, and it engages our imagination, right? I mean, when you watch something on television, um, it's all right there. It's given to you. You may know that um, I say television, but of course, on our computers or, or um, tablets or whatever, but they did research where they found that a person, their brain is less active when they're watching television than when they're sleeping, Right. So, I mean, think about that. So and why is that? Because when you're sleeping, you're using your imagination. Right. So when you read, you have to use your imagination. You have to visualize things. And there's ways in which this isn't just good for training your mind. It's actually also pleasant for us. It's actually part of um, it's part of living a flourishing life for us. We enjoy it. And even today, plenty of kids still love reading, you know, the Harry Potter books. And I know I'm a little bit of out of date with that, but you know, there's plenty of other young adult series since then and kids love reading. So reading is important both for training your mind and for enjoying your life and for learning about others. I, I don't know how accurate this is. Give me a second. Uh, there's a bit of a light here. I'm just gonna uh, put down the cursor if I can. Um, there's a, there's a, a fun anecdote, which uh, I, I've, I've watched at, um, I don't know, one of those philosophical accounts I follow on Instagram. And I saw a quote by Socrates, but it doesn't really sound like him. But anyways, the, the idea of the quote I really liked, and it said something like, read because it's, it's an easy way to learn from others without having to put in the work that others have done to learn what they know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, no, quite right. And uh, the, the comment in context might have been a criticism, like a backhanded kind of. Um, but, um, you know, one thing I saw just in the feed here, and um, I hope your viewers will forgive me because I am a latecomer to technology. And uh, when I was growing up, we still had rotary phones. Um, and uh, so I'm not good at talking and keeping an eye on the feed at the same time. But 
I saw someone say something about learning uh, a new language. And that's also very important, right? Reading helps you to understand things that are more difficult. If you're just listening, you can learn new languages, uh, become familiar with experiences that you could never have before, right? You can read an account of a soldier in combat. And even though you won't know exactly what it's like to be them, you will know it far, far better, perhaps from reading um, than you might even from watching a, a TV show. Um, and then as concerns languages, you know, I used to live in the Slovak Republic and, uh, they had a saying there, you know, well, they told me it was a saying, I only heard it once, but the saying was, the more languages you know, the more human you are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And sort of one of the sides is, um, of the conversation was why reading is important. And mm -hmm. of course, that really depends on your interests because you've got books for everything, like from yeah. you know, cooking recipes well, that might be incredible to nutrition or, I don't know, um, classical history. That there's, there's so many topics and so, so much out there um, and so much free books also at the same time. Um, but one of the, the, the first questions I always ask at the Great Books program is who here likes to read? Um, and not everyone <laughs> pop their hand up. But then we're into like, what, well, what are you reading? What are you enjoying? And, and so on. And I mean, I teach at a faculty of uh, political science and international relations. So one could understand that if you're in the humanities area, you'd maybe be more inclined to, to read. But I wanted to ask you, Matthew, what books, well, let me get philosophical only for a bit. Yeah, Why yeah, do yeah. books help uh, develop virtue? What do you mean by virtue and character? Right, right. So about virtue, I'll just say that, you know, it has various components to it. But I'd say one that's very important to virtue is it entails struggle. It has to be something hard. So if something is easy to do, we don't really consider it a sign of virtue that you can do it. Um, breathing is great, not a virtue. Um, it has to be something that actualizes a potential, right? Um, so you get a certain satisfaction. We all get satisfaction when we actualize our potential in some way or another, right? Um, if you have the potential to be a really great uh, football player, and I do mean this in the European sense of uh, football, not American football, um, and you work really hard at it and you get better and better, you take pleasure from that, right? So it's hard and you're actualizing your potential. So you see that there's an element of virtue there. And I'd say something else that's important is that it responds to you in some way as a human being. Okay, so um, animals have their own virtues, right? You know, um, dogs might be extremely good at running um, or hunting or things like that. But when human beings do this, we do it in a different way, right? We have our own way. And, um, and for us, running is about competitions, right? We love to have competitions with running. Um, hunting, you know, the hunter will talk about outwitting the animal. Some of you may not be fans of hunting. I'm not a hunter myself. But I'm just saying that whenever we exercise our virtue, we're doing it in a way which is distinctly human. So there's other things I could emphasize. I don't want to belabor the point, but just say that it has these elements. It's difficult. It's a struggle. You actualize potential. Um, and you do something that's actualizing something which is human in you, either in the way that human beings interact with each other, the way we think rationally, the things we care about, like beauty, the way we debate with each other. So there's going to be all of these elements involved in virtue. Does that, does that answer your question? It does, absolutely. I'm seeing here also that one of our students just typed Medea. I don't know if you've read it. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure, sure. I have some familiar with Medea, but what, what's the question? Oh, no, she's just, I think she's just uh, uh, bullying us. Okay, anyways, <laughs> by, by, by the way, um, everyone can ask questions, uh, and I'll try to, I've got a billion questions, but we'll try to reply to most of them if we can. Um, and I saw one about what makes a great book. Yeah. Should we, should we tackle that or what do you think? Yeah, let's see what you, go ahead with an answer. I'm going to think of one for myself if I can do. But please, what do you think uh, defines a great book? I also see something about bullying here. And I, unfortunately, I regret that I can't understand what's being she's said there. But no, I, no, no, don't worry. She's just saying that she's not bullying us. She really loved the text, Medea. That's why she's saying Oh, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, of course. I'm sure you did. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's wonderful. And, um, I mean, okay, so what, what makes for a great book? And I think that 
sometimes defenders of the great books, um, I hate to say, like sometimes they give the worst arguments on their behalf, right? They'll say, well, these are the books that have stood the test of time. Okay, well, what's the test of time? I mean, there are plenty of books have been around for a long time. We don't think all of them are great. So that actually isn't the best answer, right? Um, Sometimes the best answer we come up with is just read them, you'll see. But, uh, you know, that's, you know, yeah, someone's going to take the time to read uh, 20 of the great books. If they're not convinced, they're not going to invest that kind of effort. Um, I think that the great books themselves help us to understand what a great book is in this sense. So let's say, um, I know, Will, you're, you're a bit of a fan of Plato's Republic, if I'm, I'm correct there. So in Plato's Republic, he identifies three major parts of, a, of your personality. One is your... Um, your ability to speak and reason about things. Another is your emotional, the emotional side of you, right? Your uh, anger, love, you know, that stuff. And then the third is the appetitive side by which he means the feelings of pleasure and pain, right? And, um, and you can tell these are all different, right? Calculating is not the same as feeling love and love is not simply pleasant, right? It could be pleasant or painful or both at the same time, right? So these are different parts of the human psyche. And, a great book, I would argue, um, for, uh, you know, as implied by Socrates, is a book that actually speaks to all those parts of you at once. So the book may, so in some way, it draws pleasure and pain out of you. You experience pleasure and pain when you're reading it. Um, it's also something that really stirs up your emotions, right? You feel, um, you may feel anger or love or, or a variety of fear, even uh, anxiety as you read the book. Um, and then also it, it actualizes your higher functions so that you can, um, you have to think about it and analyze it. It provokes you to. And I know people will say, um, oh, I don't like analyzing a book. I just want to read it and enjoy it. I'm going to come to that in a minute. But a great book actually invites you to analyze it. And you can't help it. And it's the kind of book that when you read it, you actually want to talk to someone about it and really go deep with it. Um, but there's two other things I would add here about a great book is that, you know, there's a lot of books that can do that. I mean, frankly, a stupid book, and forgive me for saying, I don't want to sound pompous, but um, a stupid book could also make you analyze it, right? And you could analyze it and conclude it's not a terribly good book. But, but you know, a, a book like that can still provoke you to think about it. So what is it that makes a great book a truly great book? And I think, and this is going to start to answer your question about virtue. Okay, so, you know, for all of us, we have emotions that compete with each other. We have goals that compete with each other, um, long term and short term. And the way we negotiate those conflicts has a lot to do with whether we're going to be virtuous or, or more vicious, right? So let's say you care about being good to your friends and you want to have friendships. Um, someone tells you a secret. And you, you need to be virtuous and keep that secret. You gave your word, you want to keep your word. But then you know there's someone else that if you betray this secret to them, they'll find you more interesting and that will allow you to start to develop that friendship with that person. And we all know people like this. We call them gossips. Maybe all of us at some time or another have said something we shouldn't have said. And so you have these two desires connected with building your friendships that conflict. And then you betray the confidence and then you feel guilty, right? You feel guilty because of the conflict within you. Um, so what would be ideal is if you didn't have that conflict within you, right? If you had a bit more harmony within you, if you were able to negotiate these things, if you had a temptation to break your word and you were able to resist that temptation, or if you were afraid, if someone was threatening you in some way, but you're were, you were still able to stick to your guns and have courage in the face of that fear, and I think the Socratic model says, you know, the great books help you with that journey. The way they elicit pleasure and pain, the way they elicit or solicit your emotions and your thinking leads you to start to think about how to, how to be a better person. Maybe it even inspires you to start to think through how to reconcile these things within you, these conflicts within you. And you could say, so it sounds very philosophic, uh, Matt, the way you put it. It doesn't have to be. Right, often literature is far better um, at eliciting your emotions, um, but it can also be very sophisticated and something that you have to think about very deeply. Um, ancient drama, Medea, uh, Oedipus Rex, um, many, many of those ancient works, and sometimes they show really terrible things, but the point is in you thinking about them and going through them, it's supposed to transform you. And this leads me to the, the second additional point I wanted to make about great works. 
they have to be true, right? They don't show you a false image of human nature or of human life. They may distort it. They may give you a narrow picture on it so that you just see one part and you go deep into that one part. But ultimately what makes a great book a great book is that it's deeply insightful, right? And, and really helps you to encounter what our lives are actually like. Mm-hmm. Does that sound? It and makes, does that help with the virtue it, it, character it, it question? It really makes a lot of sense. I also added to that, that sometimes you find great writers that have an amazing and beautiful style and express their words with a lot of beauty, but they're basically repeating what other people have said before them. Yeah. And then you have incredibly original thinkers who are not very easy to read. And for yeah. them, you need to have those two things, this sort of easy style of, of writing that really helps the reader into what you're trying to say, uh, and a lot of beauty in the way you write, mm-hmm. and at the same time, um, making them a better person while reading, uh, giving them more insight. I, I think I'd never thought of it like you're saying, um, in the sense that it gives you more insight into the human condition, but I think it's, it's absolutely right. Um, also, one of the things that I like about great books is those authors that start with a, with a sort of a huge, beautiful, beautifully put phrase like, um, man is born free, but everywhere he's in chains or something like that. And you're like, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, Rousseau, Rousseau is great uh, for turning a phrase. Yeah, he has another line. Uh, Everything is good as it comes from the hand of the author of all things. Everything degenerates in the hands of man. <laughs> so, you know, he's, he, knows how to, he knows how to go after you. But um, yeah, no, I, I think you make a good point about style. Um, we, we shouldn't neglect it, right? Um, it's very important to experience beauty in your life. And, you know, one thing is that we, beauty, by the way, is something that you can appreciate on a very basic level, it can be pleasant. It also brings out your emotions and it's also something that you can appreciate intellectually. So beauty more than anything, when it's really well developed, uh, really well presented by a great artist is something that really can inspire you. And and that's why even like hard-nosed scientists uh, and mathematicians will talk about how when they're doing problem solving, they sometimes feel like they've encountered a transcendent beauty. Like that's, that's an experience was very fundamental to the happiness of human beings. But if I may, there's one other quick thing I I would add to this is that one thing one wants to be careful of with the great books is that you don't have to be a snob about it. You know, there are the traditional great books. There may be great books we don't know, right? And and we should always keep an open mind. Um, And also, you know, I, I used to have a period in my life where I thought if I'm not reading a great book or appreciating great work, I'm wasting my time. And, you know, I would, kind of get exhausted and uh and then I wouldn't really be enjoying them so much um and because it just became drudgery like a duty oh what's the next great epic work of Russian literature I need to read now and I realized that I took up the great books in the wrong spirit when I did that right it's okay to enjoy something a bit of pulp fiction just because it's pleasant um it's okay sometimes to read something that you know is gonna sweep up your emotions and that's all it's gonna do. I think what the tradition teaches us though is you need to be careful and make sure that that isn't all you do in your life. Give yourself a little bit of time to enjoy a simple pleasure, a little bit of time to maybe get swept up with your emotions, but make sure that you leave room for the great books as well. That's where, that's where things go wrong is if we don't have that balance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have, um... When I, when I finished my first great books course, I read them, you know that, because this is the best definition I think I've ever read of great books in general, is that famous letter of Machiavelli to Francesco Vittori, mm. um, in which he's describing how he's sort of away from political power. He lives um, in a village, a quite remote village, and he has sort of his, his little cottage um, and every day he goes out hunting, then he goes to the pub and sits with everyone and so on, listens to what's going on. And when he gets home, he says, um, I have the text here, I think. He says, on the coming of evening, I return to my house and enter my study. And at the door, I take off the day's clothing covered with mud and dust. 
and put on garments regal and courtly, and reclothed appropriately, I enter the ancient courts of ancient men, were received by them with affection. I feed on that food which is only mine and which I was born for, where I am not ashamed to speak with them and to ask them the reason for their actions. And they, in their kindness, answer me. And for four hours of time, I do not feel boredom. I forget every trouble. I do not dread poverty. I am not frightened by death. Entirely, I give myself over to them. That's, I, like, I forget every trouble. That's something that yeah, happens. Yeah. I, and I say, okay, I'm, I'm something great because I've totally forgotten trouble and I'm not stressed or annoyed. It's like, they also give you perspective, I find, on what's relevant for you as an individual. Right. Right. And to well, not be sort of swayed by the last problem you've had in a day or a discussion you've had at work or a, you know, misgiving you might have had with a friend or whatever it is. It really sort of, to me at least, it helps me, you know, it's, it's not religious because religious is, of course, something higher, I find. But, but, but at the same time, it's very, and I find it, I, I was saying it to you yesterday when we were talking that, if the world, at least Spain and Europe, is moving in a more atheist direction, it's also great counsel for profiles that might not be open to, to religion because philosophy helps a lot in that way, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, there's something more I would say about this, but or do you want to turn to some of the questions? Because you said you want to make I've sure. I've got a couple of questions, yes. I don't know if they're going to be easy for you, though, but let me, let me see if I can put them through. <laughs> so Mariana asked... Uh, this would be, it's not Mariana. She said, what's, this is the typical question the students would ask you, but you must try and respond. What's the best book you've read so far? Oof, that's a hard one. Oh, oh, you know, that's, that's a really hard question. <laughs> but you know what I'd say is I'd say um, philosophically, uh, it is Plato's Republic. Um, it's a book that uh, kicks me in the rear end every time I read it. I realize there's something I didn't understand. And, and one thing that's great about it is you get theories about what it's saying, and then you go back to the text and you realize your theory was wrong. And someone could conclude, well, that's just because it's badly written. It's not terribly coherent. But as you go deeper with the text, you actually always learn more. And that's one reason why you have to spend time with the great books. But I'm also gonna give um, a work of literature. Um, and it's uh, Sholohoff's And Quiet Flows the Dawn. I don't know if, if any of you guys know this work, um, but it describes the period of the Russian Revolution and the experience of Cossacks. And this is an extraordinarily, like for me, a very difficult book to read. Um, the, the violence and horror that it portrays um, in, in such a vivid way. Um, but one of the reasons why I'm so grateful for it, and, and, this, and this goes to the point of what it means for a great work um, to help you cultivate virtue. And don't misunderstand me. I don't think I'm an especially virtuous person, but I am a better person for having read that book. Because first of all, I mean, growing up in Canada as I did, it's not that I didn't see some hard things in my life, but compared to the Russian revolution, pretty easy stuff. Um, and this book really brought me into that moment and really helped me to appreciate the suffering of others, um, the temptation to cruelty when you're under extremely hard circumstances. So it, it helped me to understand the humanity of some of these people, but also at the same time inspired in me deeply why it is so, so important that you don't dehumanize others. So important that you don't murder others for an idea or harm others or disrespect others for the sake of an idea and just where like even little things where they go. And, and I would add to it, I mean, the characters are just so beautifully and vividly presented. So I just think that if you haven't read it, I can't necessarily recommend it. Like I said, it's a hard book to read, but for me, it, it, it changed my life in a very, very positive way. And, um, and just something about that writer, Sholohoff, um, none of his other works are considered to be as great. Um, there's even debate as to whether he wrote the work because his other works fall so short of this one and Quiet Close the Dawn. But whether he wrote it or not, the person who wrote it poured their heart and soul into that book and man, is it insightful. Wow. Wow. I remember I was, I was quite young. Um, it must have been like um, maybe, I don't know, 18, something like that. And my girlfriend, she gave me 
um, Isabel, whom you met, she oh, gave yeah, me yeah. a couple of years ago uh, the book of First Me Killed My Father about... Uh, oh, I know it. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Which is, I don't think anyone would put it maybe in the great books, but that that was that the same moment for me, like seeing the, the genocide in, in Cambodia and everything so vividly, you know, written by, by a girl who's just watching everything with, with all of the innocence that that has. That really shook my bones too. I, I have oh, to confess. Yeah. I have to confess. And uh, Matthew, I've got some other questions. Elena, uh, the secretary of the faculty, and she's a history professor too, which you, you haven't been introduced to, but, but you'd get along fine, I think. She's asking me another quite tough question, but yeah. no, I'll, I'll tell you. She'd like to know, what book did you read that you, was, you, that you maybe weren't expecting that much from, but that really surprised you? Oh, that, that is also a, a hard question. Um, okay. I'm going to go on record with this. This is confession time, right? Because I had to be surprised. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, when I lived in Slovakia, I did become aware of literature that I was not otherwise aware of. Mm -hmm. And among these is a Polish writer named Andrzej Sapkowski. And he writes these books about a warrior and, and there's a video game about it and a TV show now. And uh, just to tell you that, you know, that does not inspire in one the thought that the book is going to be worth worthy of their time. Um, but anyway, it was recommended to me and I started to look a little bit at his work and I was genuinely surprised. I mean, genuinely surprised. And uh, I've heard that he's actually quite dismayed by the fact that his, his literature has been made into video games. And I can see why, because this is a writer who's really aspiring to write literature. And I think that whether it is literature or not, so, like I'll leave it to other people to, to make their own judgments about this. But um, from what I've read, and it's not that there aren't parts of it, there's like some kind of bodily humor in it, which I just personally find kind of vulgar. Um, maybe it's funnier in Polish, but this author has an ability to capture what it might be like to live in a medieval world and even all of his metaphors are all written from what must be what he has imagined are the everyday experiences of a medieval peasant or a medieval soldier. And they are extremely inventive, often very beautiful, very thoughtful. Um, there's other parts of it where he's trying to be kind of postmodern, which I don't enjoy that much. But you just said a work that I was surprised by. You didn't say it had to be um, necessarily the greatest work of, of literature. But I'd say this, that Andrzej Sapkowski really, really surprised me. I... Um, I, yeah, I, I just find him to be a, a much deeper and more insightful. And also psychologically, he seems, he really must listen to people carefully and he really understands people. He draws his characters very, very well. Um, so that's something that recently surprised me. And uh, I know I have just half recommended a, a book that uh, is, hmm. is, or books that are most famous because of the uh, video games and, uh, and the TV series. At least I think that's the case anyway. <laughs> Uh, okay, it's fine. Something, to, if, if I'm going to go on record, uh, it, 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 I found one of the books that we were reading on, it's called Social and Cultural Dynamics by Petrim Sorokim. I'd never read him, and I'd, typical name you've heard, I've heard about him a lot. But when I read him, I, there, there are incredible insights here, but one was that trauma that you get from trying to materialize ideas when you have an institution that's starting that is very a very romantic moment uh, full of you know life and expectations and enthusiasm and so many sort of energy that's moving it but as it the price for success is creating an institution which then gets political and sort of the life that even the best institutions founded on the best ideas have had and how trouble, how troublesome it is to navigate that transition from, you know, um, one of the famous examples is the Catholic Church and how it all starts and then the institution grows, the political problems that come with it, the excesses and the not, and then, then of course, then sort of recalibrating again. 
how hard that is for political parties or in institutions, countries also. Right, right. Forming a state uh, through some values. And that was, that was, that really impressed me. And I wasn't expecting much from it, I must say. Um, well, actually, before we get to the next question, that sounds really fantastic. I'm going to have to ask you um, for more details later. But sorry to I realized uh, there's one other thing I want to say about uh, Slavkowski because I didn't do him quite justice. Um, <laughs> The theme of his work, regardless of anything else, is about what it means to be the kind of person for whom your relationships with others are instrumental. It's, it's about sexual pleasure, or it's about you know getting money, or, or what, or even sometimes about doing a noble deed and being like, well, I did my duty, and moving from that to what it means to have family when you don't have family already, um, and what it means to figure out and develop relationships in which you you love people in ways that have nothing to do with these other connections, people that you, you're really dedicated to, um, such as adopting a child and that child adopting, you know, the parent really in their own way too, and what it means for them to forge this bond and to really care about each other and to stand by each other. And I think that in our, in the world we live in today, of course, in which many of us do feel somewhat disconnected from our families, I actually think that that's something very profound, a profound um, desire that he's touching upon on us to have those kinds of deep connections with others. Anyway, sorry, Will, I didn't mean to go on about him, but I, I, I didn't want to give the guy short shrift the way I did before. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, on to the next question, yeah. <laughs> okay, I got, I've got some more. Karen Mayens is here with us, um, whom you met in Antigua Forum, of course, our incredibly great uh, lead facilitator. Yeah, I don't think yeah. and the whole event would have probably come crumbling down if she wasn't uh, uh, there. Well, that's how oh, I she's think. amazing. Absolutely. She's asked. She's got a couple of interesting questions. So the first one was, in what way are great movies similar to great books? And in what way do they differ? Is there even a term as a great movie? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great question. I do think there are great movies. Um, and I, I do think they are, of course, different from great books. Um, and I mean, one of the differences of, is, of course, I mean, I, I hate to say the obvious, but I mean, the, the visual dimension, of course, and, and the time, right? They're, they're very brief uh, as compared to a book. And um, yes, hello, Karen. <laughs> and, um, and, but nevertheless, like one of the things that I think really defines, a, you know, I'm trying to remember now if, if it was C.S. Lewis also has a, a neat definition of a great book, which is that it's any book you would read again um, after finishing it. And, um, and I think this applies to great movies too, that after you watch them, you know you need to watch them again. And there can be movies that every time you watch them, you learn something more and more and more about them. And I'll give a quick example of one such movie for me, um, which is uh, Blade Runner. And... And also its sequel, by the way, which I think is one of the best sequels to a film ever made. Uh, in all of human history, films haven't been around that long, so maybe an easy bar to meet. But, but something I'll say about Blade Runner is the first time I saw it, I was 14 and I thought it looked cool. And that was the extent of it. Um, those of you who are familiar with it know it's, it's in a future in which human beings are genetically engineered and put to labor. Um, and some of them uh, break their bonds of this labor and become murderous. And it follows a guy whose job is to track down these murderous biologically engineered escapees and to retire them, that is to kill them. And as I became older, I realized that one of the core themes of this was the capacity for human beings to not see other human beings as human beings, right? And that's interesting because the film itself is confusing. At first you think, are they mechanical? And only later does it become very clear. No, they're physical. And as I remember watching it when I was a little bit older. I'm like, this is very confusing. I thought they were robots. They're actually flesh and blood human beings. And then as I was older, I realized, yeah, that's, that's the trick of the film. The film is actually trying to put you in a position where you don't see them as human, and then you realize your mistake. Um, even later, I started to realize that one of the themes of the film was that the, the ones who suffer can't see their oppressors as human. So that was, again, you know, it wasn't until I was in my 30s that I was watching, I suddenly realized, oh man, that's another theme of the film that it's trying to present. Um, and it was only maybe a couple of years ago, I started to realize that in another way, the film is obviously about the commodification of the human, but it's also about the commodification of love. If you've seen the film, there's a character named Rachel and the main character is named Deckard. 
And that whole plot line is about how we commercialize and commodify love. But what's interesting about the film is it's about how the deep human capacity for love. Um, and I want to I want to be clear: the film does not pull its punches. There's a scene that borders on sexual assault uh, between these two people, but. But what the film is trying to show is that the deep human capacity for a meaningful and lasting love is so great that it can actually overcome all of these attempts to destroy it. Um, and that's one of the things that makes it such a powerful film. It shows the greatest human degradation and shows how people rise up from it. And it took me decades, at many, many watchings of the film to see that. And, you know, uh, Blade Runner might not be to your taste. It may be a different film that does this for you. Citizen Kane is a fantastic film. I highly recommend that. Um, but in any event, I think what I just described about Blade Runner, I would say, hits a lot of the things. And I think it does the same things that great books do, but it does it in a different way. Yeah. I'm, I was trying to think because that, that question about what makes them different. I mean, the, I always tell my, I always tell, I always joke with everyone saying, I've never heard this saying the other way around. I've never heard, oh, that was a great book, but the film was even better. I've never, I've never. <laughs> <laughs> they always, uh, me... always give it the other. It's always oh, but the book is better. So I think that I, to me, a book is an adventure, I suppose, and maybe it's because I'm working more. Do you, that example you said of TV um, and sleeping was quite alarming. Um, but but maybe when you I mean when you finish a great book you know, I feel very proud maybe more virtuous in the sense that you're saying saying I've learned something here I've contested with the author I've had to look into the history of the moment why is he referring to this like this you know I'm going slow and with a movie it's all sort of cut and done for you in a way and yeah. sometimes I I can get annoyed if it's too complicated the plot and if it's demands seeing it four times before you understand it. Um, <laughs> Which, which happens sometimes. Yes, um, yes. So also I think that in movies, style is as important as in writing in the sense that there needs to be, it needs to be fun. You need to, you need to have feeling uh, mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. it and feel, it doesn't have to be beauty, it can be excitement, fear, whatever the, the director is trying to put down. But related to that, Galen was asking you, do you sometimes reread books? I know you do because of your profession, but what is the book you have most reread? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's another uh, great, great question. I mean, just in general, um, you could guess the answer. So I, I have um, reread probably Plato's Republic more than any other book, and I have also read it in, in more than one language. Um, but, uh, and again, uh, actually the novelized form of Blade Runner is something that I have read more than once. Uh, often great literature is something that I have not read more than once because like Shalahoff's and Quiet Close the Dawn, I am planning to read it again. But like I said, it's a very hard book, so I kind of dread it. Um, Shakespeare, of course, is, you know, for us English speakers, we love, at least those of us who love the great books tend to love Shakespeare. So I've read plenty of Shakespeare over and over again. Um, what about you, Will? Or, 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 I mean, even the people on the feed could also put in yeah. answers talking about books that they've read, including Karen books or, or movies or things that they've, they've come to again and again. Absolutely, please do. I think Plato's Republic has been what I've most reread too. And I'm trying to think of another book similar than that. I was deeply disturbed and it really changed me uh, by um, The Everlasting Man of Chesterton. I don't know if you've had a go. Uh, yeah, I haven't read it, but I've, it's on the list. I've heard great things. So. I, I read it because I remember C.S. Lewis <clears throat> wrote about it that that uh, uh, changed his life, that book, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, I have to read this book. It must be incredible. And I've read a whole bunch of Chesterton. I've really enjoyed it. But mostly prose. I didn't get that much into the novels, which are very famous. Um, but I don't think I've reread many other books, to be honest. I have seen movies, of course, a couple of times, but not maybe, not, not maybe books. Um, anyways, I, are people okay? I'm seeing here. One question, because I had this conversation with you and I'd really like to share it with, with the audience who's here now with us, but also mostly will be sometime in the future when they're watching this. It's always a fun thing to do, isn't it? Like, it's like putting a, uh, um, 
a small letter in a bottle and chucking it in the ocean. Um, <laughs> in some time in the future, this will be read. But um, you, you are able and versatile in reading ancient uh, Greek. So... Yeah, I can read it slowly, but yeah, go ahead, yeah. <laughs> well, but you can read most of the great books, or at least the Greek great books, in their original writing. What difference is it as an experience? I would love to know, because I can't read it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So every book that I teach, I do try to read in the original, including, uh, you know, puttering through Machiavelli's Italian. And... Um, you know, it's always a very different experience. Um, you know, there, there's different things with ancient Greek, you know, like, for example, when I was first learning ancient Greek, I read a line, a line of verse from an unknown poet describing a child sacrifice. And obviously, it's very upsetting um, to think about a child being sacrificed. But I have to tell you, the first time I read it, realizing that I was reading it in the very words that the person was thinking who saw it. That just gave me chills. You know, like 3,000 years separate us, but I am literally reading their observations and their words. You know, and I, I don't know. I just found that a strange and profound moment to think that something connecting me with a human being 3,000 years ago. But in terms of the experience of reading the great books themselves, and, and I hesitate to say this because I don't want to discourage anyone, but the books really, really open up when you read them in the original. You know, um, in the ancient world, people were famous for imitating Plato's style um, and not for being terribly interested in what he thought. This, is, this doesn't happen today. This doesn't happen today because we don't read ancient Greek. Um, Plato was an extraordinarily great writer of ancient Greek, very, very beautiful writer. Um, Thucydides, by contrast, is not a terribly beautiful writer. But something that emerges is when you read say Thucydides, um, most people say, well, Thucydides, it's all about power, right? Real politique or mocked politique. There is no justice in the world. Actually in Greek, it's very, very different experience. Um, there's words that he uses for nobility, um, for beauty and nobility. There's words that he uses for justice. Then when you read in the Greek, you suddenly start to see that he's actually using these words in a consistent way. So what's being actually shown to you is that it is true the world is a dirty place. It is true that people only care about money and power. And yet, beneath the surface, there is justice. There is beauty, if only you look for it. And that's something that so far, and I, I've been looking for a translation that this will come out in the translation, because I'd love it for my students to have the experience of it, because I think it's very important. Um, when I teach Thucydides, and I love it when a student does this, at the end of the class, they say, it's so difficult to find justice and beauty in Thucydides. Why doesn't he just tell us? Why doesn't he just come out with it? And I say to them, well, what do you think? You think you're gonna go out into the world and there's gonna be flashing neon signs saying, this is justice, this is beauty? <laughs> or do you think what you're gonna see is human beings mistreating each other? You're gonna see a lot of incompetence. You're gonna see a lot of bad politics. You're gonna have conflicts with your family members. And actually justice and beauty are gonna be very hard to find. But when you find them, you're gonna realize that there is a better way to live your life. And that is the way you wanna live your life. You wanna be a just person. You wanna dedicate yourself to beauty. And by the way, to be clear, you can do this in any walk in life. You don't have to be a, a history professor, although I think that's a very noble profession, but um, you can do this as an engineer. You can do this as an entrepreneur. I mean, look at the things that the entrepreneurs that founded UFM have built, right? I think these are people that knew a great deal about justice and beauty. So in any event, this is a work that teaches you that even though these things are very difficult to find, you can find them. And, and it's amazing when you take this journey with Thucydides, it's amazing. But this is a journey that's really only available to someone in the Greek. And, and when I teach, I do my best to try and convey that to the students, even though we're, we're dealing with it in English. Mm -hmm. Matthew, have you been to Greece? No. <laughs> we have to organize that because you can be my official translator when we get on the sites. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, would, I would love to visit that country with you. And, uh, and uh, yeah, we, we, could, we would have some fantastic discussions. You know, I, I have a friend who's of Greek descent, and he says, to, he says to me, do you know where the Greeks go on vacation? Do you know? Nowhere. They're already there. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, their, that's their joke. <laughs> Okay. 
Okay, I don't know. Let me just scroll down because I have some comments here also. I, I think Ale is here. Osorio, she was um, commenting The Witcher. She's one of our teachers of the Great Books program, as a matter of fact. Don't know if she's still here. I don't know if she's still with us. If she is, why don't you share with us? We'd like to know. Also, Elena, who's a history professor, the latest. What, what book have you mostly reread? Because I think that's a fantastic question. Um, oh, like most I, recently reread? No, in general. As, as in our case, that would be the Republic. But in their case, I want them to share what they what they read. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, another of our students, who I don't know if he's still here, Paulo is saying, for someone who wants to start reading, he's 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 um, I think going thinking of great books. What would you recommend? What would the first book that you'd recommend be? Right, right. So if we're talking about great books, um, I must confess I would uh, need to know him better because uh, it, it really is a, an individual thing. Um, so someone who likes to think and argue, uh, I would recommend Plato um, and uh, maybe the Gorgias. Often when I recommend a book, I give a little advice first. Um, because it's easy to read. It's interesting. It's easy to read a certain great book and be repelled by it. I mean, you kind of wish it weren't true, but it is true. Um, and sometimes someone needs a little bit of prodding. Um, of course, in terms of appreciating the complexity of English drama, of course, it would be Shakespeare. And uh, again, it depends on the person, you know, I, you know, Hamlet, for those of you with a tragic bent of mind, maybe much ado about nothing. Uh, if you have a comedic bent of mind. Um, I mean, certainly Russian literature is often a great place to dive into if you have a bit of a melancholic streak. Yes, I see someone said the Iliad. That's a that's excellent to be one of your favorite books and an excellent book to drop into. Um, and the advice I would give for someone reading the Iliad, and uh, um, if I'm pronouncing this correct, Alema could also give her own tips for reading it, is to really let yourself see the figures in the book as human beings. I find sometimes when people approach the great books, they let everyone become an archetype and maybe they are an archetype in some way, but a character like Achilles or Agamemnon or Patroclus or Hector, they really unfold their riches when you see them as complex human beings. And especially when you're sensitive to the fact that the poet doesn't tell you everything. Um, just like in real life, we have to kind of fill in the gaps and try and figure out what someone is implying, figure out what they're, th they're thinking um, based on our experiences of real human beings. And Homer and Sophocles and Plato and Shakespeare um, and the modern Rousseau, any of these people demand this of you. But Will, what, what would you recommend for people to start with? I, do you know... Um... I had the experience uh, last year, we had two great books program and it'd been a tough first semester for the students. And so for the second semester, I, I was telling you, I think uh, tragedy and comedy are great um, because you're having a fun time. Um, for example, I think my favorite, uh, I prefer tragedies to comedies, but generally, but. Out of the comedies, and that might be in my top, would be Assembly of Women, of Aristophanes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was, um, I can't, I can't really, really describe it, but I was saying this is actually the best criticism of communism I've ever read, and it's, you know, two thousand five hundred years before communism, whatever, um, and it's fun. It's engaging. It could be happening today it, it, because it's it's a great it's a great work because of what you were saying at the beginning. You can really relate to it as a human being. The right, feeling of right. equality, of dignity, uh, the troubles with political power, corruption, um, and all of this. Um, one of the big lessons I took um, because to help me into facilities that I can't read Greek, I, I was telling you I read the four the four volumes of. Uh, Donald Kagan on the Polynesian. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
which yeah, I've, I've, it's been wonderful. But one of the things that most amazed me during the volumes, I mean, it's incredible. The whole thing is incredible. And it really helped me, I think, um, understand the cities a bit better. But was, I felt a bit, I don't know if the word is, I was disturbed, but at the same time, I, I felt a great peace in mm. the sense of how, in the first democracy we have in the world, how the courts are used politically. I mean, because this happens everywhere in the world. Um, and I was amazed to see how harsh the democracy was with its generals, with its leaders, um, how they would use um, all of the, the sort of they make made up political crimes of bribery and stuff like that to get people um, out of their way. Um, and I was deeply, deeply concerned. And at the same time saying, I, I'm always complaining about this, but when I read it in the CDs for the first time, I was like, wait a minute, this has been going on for like ever. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, I, people sometimes don't realize how much the ancient Greek city is you know whenever you watch like if you ever watch a tv show like the sopranos and you know you've got the crime families imagine it was that and no government and then you've got the ancient greek city right like just these kind of powerful families and if they if someone's in their way they put out a hit on them you know mm -hmm. um yeah something i would add too is that you're right like these works can be very profound i mean um like seneca's play oedipus um you know, like, what are we going to learn from a play like that? It's about a guy who was cursed to murder his father and, and marry his mother, and that's what happens. But if you read it, and you read it really carefully, um, and you get through the gruesome parts, you realize that the message of it is that Oedipus is the kind of person that actually wants to live in a beautiful world. And the world disappoints him. It's actually not beautiful. And he becomes angry because he wants it to be and because it isn't, he needs to punish somebody. And he curses himself, right, in, in the process. But the message of the, of the play, and this surprised me, I had to read it a couple of times to see this, is that sometimes when the beauty you wanna see in the world isn't there, the correct response isn't to punish people harshly for their injustice, it's forgiveness. And the implication of the play is that you also need sometimes to attend to what's necessary in forgiveness and healing in a community. And I just found this uh, an amazing and profound kind of thing because when you realize that Seneca uh, knew the emperor Nero, right? Um, so no one is more familiar with human degradation than him. And they think he wrote it when he was in exi exile and contemplating suicide. So imagine the strength of char character it took for him to realize the importance of forgiveness in one's life. Um, and again, this is, and you could say, well, what, what do the great works have to offer to an entrepreneur or to an engineer? But, you know, entrepreneurs aren't just about making money. Engineers aren't just about building bridges. They're human beings as well. And if they're to live flourishing lives, these are things that are going to be important for them as much as for everyone. Um, in their work, you know, in their relationships with their family, their neighbors, their fellow citizens. Okay. Um, Alema? Ali, I don't know if you want to make a comment on the Iliad or anything you'd like to share with us, would be great. Yeah. Um, so, Matthew, I, we still have a couple of minutes left, but if we're lucky, maybe for one more comment. But I don't have, I have a couple of more questions, but they'll have to wait for your visit to Guatemala, probably uh, <laughs> sometime next year. But, oh, I'd love to do that. Uh, would, you, what, would you like to have some final comments before I close the conversation? Oh, um, well, actually, uh, I have a question for you, Will, if I may. Um, and maybe we don't really have enough time here at the end. But I'm just kind of curious, I mean, in your experiences teaching, and anyone could, could jump in on this, um, why do you think the great books aren't as appreciated today? Or do you think they are appreciated in the this is just in my head because a lot of people on this call said they they love them but that could be self-selecting the kind of people who come here would would be fond of them to begin with but why might they not be so appreciated today i think there are many things um, at play one is reading is a tough is tough reading demands energy and it's i don't think it's clear the benefits it has for for many of the students um, mostly 
because I think they they've had bad experiences, you know. Yeah. For example, during my five year degree at university, like 90 percent of the teachers, instead of giving us great books um, on psychology, for example, or philosophy, whatever it was, we were just looking at manuals and mm. um, typical academic and, or teachers that are just passing through the blackboard notes and you're just copying what they're saying. It's terrible. It's a terrible, terrible process. So I think it's not obvious for a lot of the people why reading and great books, of course, because it's another totally different experience to have great books. Um, that's one side. The other side, I think, is because because we're in this sort of, you're more advanced or degraded in this in, in North America than in Europe, but everything that starts in North America end up, ends up in Europe like 30 years later. So I know that's <laughs> going to be my fight. All of this um, ideas about tolerance and um, super openness to other ideas, um, which, which sounds so, so politically correct and from an intellectual point so sound, in the end, what they're doing is because everything's important, then nothing's important. And I know you've got some big, um, big feelings in, in, in this area of interest. And so I don't think they feel very proud of, of where they come from, uh, because they made to think all of the badness of the empire and of Europeans over the world and so on. So why would we learn anything from, from, from these, you know, perhaps? Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And if um, I know we're at time, but if I may throw something in here really quickly, is I think this is something worth noting that, you know, as I said before, sometimes the advocates of the great books end up accidentally being their greatest enemies, right? You yeah. know, they, they threaten their students, you know, with bad grades if they don't read it. Those students feel the pressure becomes drudgery. Um, it would be amazing to students to realize that, for example, in Czechoslovakia under communism, there were people who snuck out in the night at the risk of getting caught and arrested so they could meet the thinker Jan Patochka and discuss Aristotle. Right. So the very thing that these students are trying to avoid having to do their homework of reading the Nicomachean ethics is something that people literally risk their lives to do once it was denied to them. And, and you know, adding to it in, as well, in terms of the benefits, you know, we know that uh, or we've seen there's some statistics that show that when people stop working, when they retire, they usually live another 10 years. But where this changes is people that do intellectual things in their retirement, they live a lot longer. And that's interesting. You know, it just kind of reminds you that we are mind and body. And when we do things that refresh our minds, things that we find interesting, whether it's the reading of literature or philosophy or whatever it is, um, our bodies realize we have something to live for. Right? <laughs> so they, they keep on living. But when we don't do that, we become lethargic, right? And, and we fade away. But I think it's important to, uh, to highlight here is that it can't be coercive. And, you know, and I, I feel that this is something very important thinking about UFM's mission and its, its libertarian outlook is that it isn't, it isn't good to coerce people into appreciating beauty, right? They need to be invited in. They need to find it for themselves. And, and, and that's how they fall in love with it. Mm -hmm. I never told you, but I, I was thinking before our conversation and with this, I'm going to close, that the reason why I read great books is to instruct myself and to learn to live better, perhaps. Um, it's not, of course, I'm more sort of down the road of political philosophy and I'm very interested in the political philosophical questions of society in general. But the real thing that I find is that, that Machiavelli I was reading about is that sort of food for yourself yeah. to really instruct yourself and help you with the tragic side of life, which is always lurking, isn't it? Some, sooner or later, you're going to be exposed to tragedy. So maybe with the help of some of these um, great books, that can be an easier ride. Yeah, you're right. And, and, you know, I think going to your explanation of why people don't appreciate the great books, and this is going to sound a little strange, but I think it's true. It's I, think because... we've got like, I think we've got like 40 seconds. So... Oh, okay, I'll say it quickly. Yeah. Is that we, um, we don't teach young people that they're worth more. They're not just consumers. They're not just workers. Um, they can belong to that great court and put on those great clothes and have these great ideas and these fantastic conversations and engage these beautiful things. They need it and they deserve it. 
and they then they need to learn that you know and, and when they don't then they expect the, they expect entertainment from the great books and when they don't find it they turn away from them absolutely so matthew thank you so much for your time carmen has just joined um hopefully we can be in touch and i'd like to have another we could, we could organize another chat of this some some months ahead that'd be great yeah, I very much look forward. Thank you so much, Will, for your many insights and for everyone who dropped in for a little bit. Really appreciated it. And I hope next time we'll hear a bit more from, from the other folks as well. It'd be great. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Matthew. Take care. All right, you too. Take care. Bye-bye.